Hello and welcome uh, this morning to part one of a two-part presentation uh, in regards to risk management. Um, hello, my name is Dave Cox. Uh, I'm a clinical practitioner working within the Family Network Services team. Um, and I'm going to be a pilot today um, for this first part, which is the Framework for Risk Assessment Management and Evaluation, um, recently released by the Scottish Government. And um, the second part will be the care and risk management process, which is basically the operational aspects of this framework. Um, I'm sure you all hope, like I do, that we want our children here in Scotland to grow up loved, safe and respected so that they can realise their full potential. However, in a very small cases of children um, that exhibit really risky behaviours uh, towards themselves and towards others, we need a framework and we need a process um, as a multi-agency network to work with these children and to reduce or remove some of that risk and potential harm. So I'd like to move forward. So before we move forward um, with the um, framework document and going in a bit deeper to see what it offers us, I'd like to put on a video um, you know, the usual starting video to get us in the mood, set the tone and inspire us. And I, I found a video that really isn't about risk management um, and assessment and evaluation specifically, but it, it gives us one of two things and leads us nicely on, I think. Um, first and foremost, it, this young man in the video in the next slide talks about um, how one adult can make a difference. And I work with those people every day. I work in multi-agency where people are really striving to make a difference. And it's often easy to think we don't, but we do. The second thing um, I think that really does come out in this video talks about the distressing behaviors of this young man as a child and some of the reasons behind that. Um, and I think we as professionals, when we're facing difficult behaviors, have to try and interpret um, these behaviours and that is about risk management and uh, it informs us. So I'm going to invite you to watch the next slide um, and I will see you on the other side. So please enjoy. I uh, would be interested to hear anybody's thoughts at uh, any time. Uh, please let me know. Okay. I tried to kill myself with a bottle of pills. And the fact of the matter is I trusted no one. And looking back, I guess, how could I? From the time my parents left me, to the time another foster kid raped me, to the time I was bullied so bad, I genuinely could not fathom a world where I could trust anybody. So fast forward, here I am, 14 years old, and entering my umpteen foster home. I was a pro, a veteran at this whole, sort of getting kicked out of one home, moved to the next. You meet these people who were like, literally complete and total strangers 10 minutes ago, who are now apparently your mom and dad. You know, kids don't take candy from strangers, just move in with them. <laughs> so I'm sitting in the van, in the driveway of this next home, and that's when I see Rodney. He's standing up there on the front porch, and immediately I notice, this is a large fella. He's six foot five, he's 350 pounds, and as a 14 year old boy, I couldn't help but notice when he's turned to the side like that, he's shaped like a lowercase b. It's amusing now, but in the moment it was tactical. Maybe that's how I could get kicked out of this home. Maybe I could get under his skin about his weight. So I move in with him, I'm being obnoxious, I'm being ungrateful, I'm being just downright rude and mean, I'm setting things on fire, and three years later, I can't shake this guy. <laughs> Rodney won't kick me out. So I step up my game. I go to the local bank in town, I open up a checking account, I put about 90 bucks in there. Then I proceed to write $10,000 worth of checks. Obviously, checks bouncing one after the next after the next. One check that bounced was for my car insurance. 
I'm going down the road speeding, Stillwater, Oklahoma, 88 miles an hour. No car insurance, no driver's license. I get pulled over, handcuffed, thrown in the back of a cop car, and sent to jail. I call Rodney. Like, Rodney, I'm in Stillwater, I'm in jail. I'll tell you the whole thing when you get here. Can you please come bail me out tonight? He said, I will come bail you out, but not till tomorrow. Rodney frustratingly believes sometimes one of the most loving things you could do for a kid was allow them to sit in either the success of their wonderful choice or the stupidity of their foolish choice. Next morning, he comes, bells me out, exactly as promised. We have a long, very awkward car ride home. No one says anything. We get back to the house. He's like, we need to sit down and talk. And I knew this moment had finally come. So Rodney, his wife, sent me down to give me the talk I've had a dozen times. He looks in my eyes and says, son, you can keep causing problems. You can keep trying to mess up. You can keep pushing us away. You can keep trying to get us to kick you out of here. But you've got to get it through your thick head, son. We don't see you as a problem. We see you as an opportunity. And in that moment, all my skepticism came to the surface. And I thought, what a cheesy, stupid thing to say to a 17-year-old kid. But then I was overwhelmed with the reality that this guy actually meant it. He didn't see what I was, what was on the surface. The obnoxious kid, the ungrateful kid, the kid getting suspended. He saw what I could be. It was genuinely my turning point. Statistically, I am supposed to be dead, in jail, or homeless. But because of one caring adult. I'm not a statistic. Every kid is one caring adult away from being a success story. Every child who winds up doing well has had at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive adult. My friend and mentor Reggie Joyner taught me to think about it this way. In this jar are 936 marbles. Each one of these marbles represents a single week from the birth of a kid until that kid turns 18 years old. So if you know a nine-year-old, you've only got 468 marbles or weeks, however you want to look at it, remaining. You know a 16-year-old, you got 104 marbles remaining. Right here, we are looking at time. In fact, you're looking at all the time or all of the weeks you have left to influence this kid, this kid, or this kid before they turn 18 and begin making critical life decisions without your presence. The difference between a statistic and a success story is you. Hello and welcome uh, this morning. So the framework document um, right at the very beginning sets a, a tone of belief and it sets an expectation, a, a value, I suppose, um, that children are in the throes of their cognitive, their physical, their emotional uh, development. Uh, and they are not, in fact, many adults. Um, they experience the world differently. They have a limited set of experiences on which to draw on. And the children we work with ha um, may have very um, obscure experiences that will uh, make their view of the world feel very different to, say, peers. So that's a really good starting point. Um, to, to how we look at children, and that will come back throughout this presentation. When we're looking at serious harm, I think it's always useful that we all have a shared definition, and the framework offers a working definition. And I'm just going to read that out, and I won't refer to it later in the presentation, but it's just worth keeping in mind. So working definition for serious harm is uh, there is a likelihood of harmful behavior of a violent or sexual nature, which is life-threatening, 
and or traumatic and from which recovery whether physical or psychological may reasonably be expected to be difficult or impossible so that's um, the working definition when we're also working with um, challenging behaviors harmful behaviors we have to consider the intention of those behaviors what's behind it what's been communicated what's the function we have to look at force and coercion whether there's any form of exploitation of the child or from the child and I think we always have to think in terms of um, the actual harm that's been done but we also need to uh, look at potential harm and how that may escalate and uh, are on a trajectory moving forward So further as an introduction, uh, working with children, again, it's a, it's a case that we have to remember that the children are in the process of development. They'll be at a specific developmental stage. Oftentimes, in my experience, children are uh, pre-adolescent or adolescent who are showing these really harmful behaviors. Again, they're not many adults. They experience the world very differently through very different eyes. Um, they are subject to many influences through their parents' modelling behaviours, to their parented experience, to their peers around them, to their school, to their culture, to their community, to their extended family. Many influences upon a child's life. And they are trying all the time to take a lot of these in and process them in terms of how it pertains to them. So we're looking at children through the lens of child development where they should be, what could be expected at a specific time, and um, you know what the deviances are of that, where they've gone off the path, and how we might be able to bring them back and help them back on the track to their normative child development. Um, risk management should always be trauma and systemically informed, especially with this very small group of children. We should look at whole systems approach, not just in terms of the influences, but how to help this child and what trauma this child has had. And we have to be aware of the situation and contextual factors. Uh, and that means, you know, from the home to the school or college or workplace to social life to going downtown and what happens in each of those cases. This is what the framework I ask us to look at and identify. Um, as part of the initial working with this child. And in terms of assessments, um, adult assessments are not best practice when working with children. Um, most assessments, uh, if they are a broad kind of spectrum assessment, um, you know, have a targeted assessee, whether it's a child or an adult, or other assessments have a very specific task uh, to perform. So it's best to use a tool that's appropriate for the job. So the framework looks at uh, risk and I think it's important to highlight the understanding of risk. Um, risk is an inherent part of growing up and we cannot and should not seek to eradicate all risk in a child's life. We would be doing that child no favours. Uh, we would probably stunt their development and probably not um, have the right preparation for them moving to adulthood. Um, however, there are a few cases, as I've said, where that requires um, everyone around the child has a duty to to help and support that child to prevent, you know, any serious harm to themselves or others and to help them move forward in, in their life. And so we talk about systemic intervention and we look at the whole child's world uh, with a view to understand that child's world and intervene where necessary. We have the rights of children to protect. That's our job. We are there to intervene, but we intervene with, you know, not overstepping our boundaries. As, um, and we also there to inform the child of their rights, what they can expect from us and how they are protected by the law. Um, through the risk management process, this becomes a formal risk assessment and that is covered in another presentation in terms of the CALM, which is part two, which I'll mention several times during this presentation. Um, and the present, but the, the framework document gives overall guidance uh, to how to do that formal risk management when there's the appropriate level of risk. And it's just keeping in mind that uh, definition of, of serious harm that we heard a couple of slides ago. 
And we also need to differentiate between offending and non-offending behaviours. Um, and I think we'll go into that more. But basically, not every child has to be an offender. There are um, times when that will happen. Again, we'll talk about that later. And But there are um, times when non-offending behaviours, self-harming behaviours or um, where children are being exploited themselves. And this is kind of coming out in distress in communication, you know, so they're not necessarily also wrapped in the legal system. So um, continuing on with the frame guidelines, um, basically frame sits within a wider context. It sits in a legislative context and it sits in a government and local government policy context. Before we get to that point, um, I'd like to just kind of touch on the principles and approach of frame. Um, basically, the idea of the guidelines is to promote defensible decision making. This asks us to consider what we're doing, how we're doing it and what we're going to do for how long, how long are we going to intervene in this child's life, what does it look like to feel safe, etc. And then we can also promote and, and communicate that to, to everyone involved, including the families. Um, and it also gives us um, a structure for risk management, uh, which is not dictated that we must do it this way or this way, but it gives us the guidelines on how to form or what we should include as a minimum in our local process and procedures. Um, the idea is, is that for the, if the government is offering guidelines on that, it gives us confidence as managers and practitioners to work in something that's already a challenging and difficult situation. Um, and that we can accept and look at certain things and that nothing's missed if we follow that process of procedure. In a legislative context, then basically two things decide whether a child is um, is put through the courts, the age, and of course, the severity of the behaviour. So um, I think it's useful to note that since May 2019, it was proposed at that point that no child under 12 um, you know, would face prosecution. And certainly that's been around, um, you know, only children over the age of 12 could possibly be prosecuted in a court of law. Um, if children do have um, severe behaviours that are causing, you know, that we may even label as criminal behaviours, under 12 years of old since 2011, that really needs to look be looked at through a child protection context. And that was uh, enshrining law through the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act 2010. Uh, should a child over 12 be subject to criminal proceedings, then basically uh, this is when the multi-agency public protection arrangements kick in. And uh, this is a, a, a multi-agency organisation that really looks and manages offenders up to the age of 18. That doesn't mean, though, that should a child um, be in um, the legal context that basically up to the 17 and a half years of age that there could be some management of those behaviours uh, through the children's hearing system. Um, and that's a very important uh, point to note that one does not preclude the other. Um, and we also look in the context of public protection concerns that this child if they are released in, you know, into the public arena, can their, can their behaviours be managed in such a way as not to cause further harm to themselves or others? So it's really important to think of it that way. Um, within policy, we're asked to really look at whole systems approach, uh, getting it right for every child. Um, you know, we also look at child and adult protection measures. Um, there's a transitionary aspect to that, a child becoming an adult, and also what adult protection measures can be put in place you know, um, you know, from this, from the child, child's behaviours in some contexts. Um, we also have to look at um, the child's situation. We have to look at trauma, historical trauma, ongoing trauma. We have to look at the offending behaviours. We have to look at their vulnerabilities. And we have to kind of look at what their childhood experience has been like. Has it been adverse? You know, um, and we also look at the promise, uh, the aim, of the government to, to offer something to every child um, at each level. So taking a formal risk management approach, um, basically it's important to note that it's not required and appropriate in all circumstances. For it to be appropriate, um, there needs to be serious harm to self or others based on the definition 
that the that we spoke about earlier on and where it's appropriate we need to access and review the support and services available we need to look at key considerations which we'll just go over very briefly in the next slide because um, there's a few of them we need to look at family skills and resources we need to look at special assessment and uh, we, we talk about speech and language therapy here and that's important i'll be coming to it for in the next slide but it could be other special assessment by calms by psychiatry it all depends on what the needs of the child is and we also need to be reminded you know that we are trying to prevent further trauma so we really need to be guarded about how we take an approach taking a formal risk management approach is traumatic for families and we need to really kind of ensure that we keep that in mind when we're working with families. So when we're taking a formal risk management approach, there are further considerations to start digging into. We need to look at the nature of the actual or the likely harm. You know, if it should happen again, what's going to happen? What's the damage and who is going to be harmed by that behavior? And that can be everyone around the child. That's the child's family, siblings, parents, at the wider family, it could be school, it could be peers, it could be people known or unknown in the community uh, and such like. Um, we look at the likelihood of that and we're asking ourselves, where does it happen? Where does it happen? What situations, what's the triggers? And also what's the potential impact on the individual? And again, all those around the child. We look at the impact uh, on and the consequences for the child's health and development should the harm occur. And we're also looking at the impact on other, the developmental impacts and trauma that this might have on other people. Um, we look at the child's development within the context of the family uh, or the care placement, as well as the wider environment. And how can um, that context minimize or reduce the harmful behaviors? For instance, um, you know, if it's if it's a person that triggers these harmful behaviors how can we reduce exposure to that person if it's somebody in class can we move them can can the child be moved can we you know we have to explore all the alternatives we have to look at individual needs uh, medical conditions and communication impairment or disability that may affect uh, the child's developing uh, what we might need to look at is other means of meeting the needs met by the harmful behaviors for instance you know, if harmful behavior is triggered by feelings of frustration because they can't get their emotions across, for instance, how do we offer and upskill that child to be able to express themselves um, in, in a more positive way rather than uh, acting out and trashing the joint? We look at the capacity of the parent to care is to meet the needs of the child. And this is also included the, the child's need to be safe. And we need to look at how children are monitored and supervised in all aspects of their day you know is there something we can offer to parents can we can we help them discover what the triggers are for instance for their child's behaviors you know we can look at you know what's happening in that child's life outside the home and how can those people help um you know so this is really important that through this part of reformer risk management we need to know how and where and who is going to be able to support monitoring and supervising the child to prevent these harmful behaviors coming out. We'd look at the familial and environmental context. Um, sometimes um, familial context could be that very hard day-to-day -day struggles, poverty, housing, food banks, you know, dealing with other um, medical problems in the house that the child somehow gets left in the shadow sometimes. And it could also be positive. We, we need to look at familial environmental context because we might be able to recruit people in to support. We may be able to change something in the environment or access something in the environment. You know, if a child's acting up uh, because they've got some excess energy, you know, especially at a younger age, you go to the park, is there other things that they can do to let go of that energy? We need to be really creative around how we approach this. We need to um, look at the necessary skills, expertise and resources available and accessible um, it's okay to say we could we could want something for a child but if it's not in the local area for instance then it can restrict the access to that and we need to look at the benefits that the child will gain from safely managing that risk you know um, when we're managing that risk you know what's in it for the child 
what can they gain out of it? Can they be upskilled? Can they feel better about themselves? You know, so it's all about confidence and belief. Um, I come back to speech to language. Um, there's a study done a few years ago um, with a direct correlation between offending behaviours and serial, serious harmful behaviours and speech language communication problems. Um, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's a really high proportion of people in uh, prison and offending institutes or under the ward of the courts that they do have speech and language problems. So this is a major area um, to really think about if the child needs uh, any kind of support or help um, communicating any aspect of their risks, any aspect of their behaviours. We, again, we need to be helpful and creative in providing a context and environment to do that, to support that child. So, frame principles. Um, so we looked at the, the principle of, of, um, of what frame is. But in this context, we're actually looking for the overarching principles for risk management. Um, I think we'll just put them all up there and, and just talk through them, really. So what we're talking about is a consistent shared framework. The guidance gives us this. This is what it's all about. We can all read this. We can all understand this and we can talk about this together. And it's one framework. So we're all not doing different things. It's one framework where we all come together um, and make decisions that are defensible. For this child that we can know what we're doing why we're doing it and how we're going to do it and for how long we want to look at the ethical principles um, and ethics comes in frame um, it's about benevolence um, you know and with a view to do no harm that there's uh, self-efficacy uh, where we can that the rights are maintained and that what we really need to do is, is we don't need to do for people, but we need to self-empower so that they can up, be upskilled, understand themselves better and be encouraged to move forward with their lives. Um, we need to really understand that the intervention needs to be proportionate to the risk. Um, this is something that comes out quite strongly. Um, we don't want to over overprotect, you know, we do not want to take away um, the complete life of a child um, to manage something that could be managed with a with a lesser approach so you know for instance we can't ground a child for the rest of their lives you know we can't we can't force them to stay inside what we need to do is is offer real world alternatives to that and that the intervention supports them and encourages them to move forward and doesn't really hold them still um Legitimate to our role and boundaries of corporate parenting. Um, basically, we have a boundary and we should always be very aware that that boundary can be overstepped but unintentionally. So we always need to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it and why we're doing it. And do we have that right? Do we have that boundary? And, you know, what's ours and only picking that up to make sure we don't overstep. We want to take action that's appropriate and specific for the task. Uh, it's no good doing emotional approaches when we're trying to do cognitive uh, psycho uh, education. Uh, what we want to look at is to look at the, the, the behaviour, we want to look at the underlying motivators and function of that behaviour and then we want to take on that behaviour and try and give it some uh, different means to express itself. Um, so it really has to be appropriate. Uh, we need to talk about risk management being meaningfully communicated to families, to all those involved, those that don't necessarily come to the calm. You know, it's important to say that not everybody comes to the calm, but everybody might need to know. So, you know, the teacher might come to the calm, but the PSA might not. So we need to ensure that those guide, you know, that everybody's counted in and what people are giving into the calm, even when they don't attend, is being communicated back out and is being accepted and I think that really comes out strong in the frame guidelines. Um, we want to put our risk management in preventative practice. Um, we, we're not here to punish children first and foremost, we're not here to um, hold them back. What we're trying to do is, is to halt and reduce the escalation so that really means we have to follow through on some of the things we spoke about in the last slide. Um, and we need to get in there as soon as we possibly can, earliest intervention. Um, there's no means or need to wait for a conviction or even if we're talking about potential harm, uh, you know, that, that 
we can project certain behaviours becoming violent towards others, although they may not be now. It's 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 been pointed at the inner self. Basically, what we're doing is we're not going to wait. We're going to try and intervene as at the earliest opportunity. So when we're working in a multi-agency context, Frame provides us um, the the. I, the idea of benchmarking, benchmarking for effective practice. Uh, this means that we we look at what we're doing as we go and seeing and tweaking, that we're evaluating and reflecting together and we're always preventing escalation where we can. And where, and where that might not work, then we need to come back, evaluate what went wrong, reflect on it, and then you know we can set, to, set that against what we'd already decided. That's the benchmark, benchmarking. And when we're producing processes, this should inform our organisation and policy, and it should also inform um, the multi-agency context, so it should be wider than just siloed agencies. It, it, it sets out that an idea um, that we agree values um, amongst all involved, you know, that we, we understand why we're involved, what we're trying to achieve, and how we're trying to achieve it. And that we all uh, are get together on board with that for the benefit of the child and their family. As mentioned before, it gives us a structured approach uh, towards um, risk management. Although, like I say, it only informs how we build our policy. It doesn't tell us what our policy should be. Uh, it ensures that within that multi-agency environment of a care and risk management, formal risk assessment, what we're doing is sharing best practice. Um, and that is strength in numbers that people can talk about best practice approach from the different elements, you know, whether it's education, health, law or social work or, or any of the other um, systemic organisations involved with a child that we're sharing each other because not one organisation can know everything. Um, what's important is acknowledging uncertainty. Um, we're not going in knowing that what we're doing will absolutely work. We... I think that's a healthy stance to take. Uncertainty means that we can try and remain open to different ways of thinking and doing things should it not go as planned. Um, and that we, we've we collated and captured all the information that we can, but there might just be that outlier piece of information that's not available to us then, but maybe then, and then we can come back and re, um, revisit some of these things that we decide in risk management meetings. So we need to acknowledge that. Because if we go in with the stiff, everything's certain, everything is managed, we're, we're potentially lying to ourselves and we could be closing down things that could be helpful for that child and benefit the family. And finally, again, it's a common language. Um, this pers first part is is offering you some of that and also, but that will be deepened in the second part when we start to look at the process that, although yes, it's owned by our city council, it really looks to partners to be a part of that process they're all in the same boat, speak the same language and moving in the same direction. So as we move again forward, just into the latter end of this presentation, um, there are five standards that come out of um, Frame. Uh, we talk about risk assessment, planning and responding to change, risk management measures, partnership working and quality assurance. So we're just going to go through those one by one just as an overview. So risk assessment, when we're doing this is a real um, crucial step in identifying which children require services and the type of intensity in, in, intervention required. Um, a lot of things can help us. We can look at the National Assessment Framework, and there's a link there. Um, we can look at specific risk assessment tools, as I mentioned previously. We don't want to use uh, the wrong tool for the wrong job. Some risk assessment tools are very much um, aimed at very specific risks. Some are more broader, some are aimed at outs, um, and so on and so on. Um, we're going to look at four key elements, which we'll come on to. Um, in the next slide, but um, so this is what Frame is offering us. We're also looking at the communication of risk assessment. Um, that is communicated responsibly that those that need to know know um, that the family are also informed and the child is informed in age appropriate language. We need to always know and see that the findings of the assessment assessment are meaningfully understood amongst everyone, that we take no assumptions that everybody knows that 
would give lots of time to um, explain for questions um, and for feedback. Um, the communication is to inform decision making, uh, why, what and how we're doing it. And we'll, we'll communicate risk in terms of the pattern, nature, seriousness and likelihood of offending. Uh, so this is this is how we do it. This is all kept in the child's plan, and um, we can also uh, look to gaining some information from court and criminal justice system. Uh, we need to be uh, careful about how we really just kind of define an individual. You know, basically, it's about looking at the the individual in their world and all their world. You know, and we're not trying to look at um, deficit-based understanding. We're trying to build on the skills and strengths that that child may already have. We're also just trying to promote a child-friendly pursuit of positive behaviours. We're trying to really kind of build that child up to be confident, to be loved and respected. So we talked about four key elements in the last one. Um, so when we're looking at key elements, we're, we're talking about identifying types of harm, key strengths. So again, whole world view of the child. Um, we look at the critical vulnerabilities, um, you know, and some of the things that this child might be able and might not be able to do. And so then how do we fill in the gaps? How do we uh, upskill? How do we educate? How do we promote? How do we build this child up? We have to identify relevant source of information. Um, I think I think generally in these circumstances we need to get as wide a view of the child as we possibly can. Um, you know, I think it's easy sometimes to potentially ignore uh, areas, especially when when a system takes a deficit-based understanding of a child. You know, looking for the wrongs, then we don't look in areas that can actually help us tell a different side of the story. So we need to include all information from a wide variety of sources and it needs to be across the spectrum of the child's behaviours. And again, we need to look at the context and patterns. So the analysis, you know, we have to move beyond the facts. We have to make assumptions, you know, and we have to really um, make some decisions around how that child is, why that child is doing what they're doing, and really look deep, scratch beneath the surface. Um, we can look at um, child's mental health, for instance. Um, you know, these these behaviours can be traumatising also for the child. They understand what they're doing is wrong. However, when they come down after it, it really can impact them in, in a mental health and, and compound an existing mental health condition. And we need to think about and analyse future behaviours, risks, real and potential. We, we can't just look at what they've done before. We really need to understand what they could potentially do in future. I might I might smack a child today. It might be a knife tomorrow, for instance. It's, it's a real, real scenario. We need to then place that world of a child down somewhere. We need to explain that to everybody. We need to look at the incidents and we need to look at historical and present information. We need to look at the affect on that child, you know, how that child is affected by what's going on. And then we need to kind of build a story, which is in fact exactly what a formulation does. So it's really not just looking at the child in this moment in time, but looking at the child in the wider context of its life, its world, its community, its culture, everything that that child needs, um, needs looking at. And then we need to build a story. Um, because once we've got that story, then we can start to change elements of that story and add difference into that child's life to try and find out how to move them from this quite potentially quite negative position to a much more positive, encouraged, loved and respected position. And this is an ongoing process, as I mentioned before, you know, it informs our decision making now. It tells us what's to be done and by whom, and it can give us a clear conclusion where everybody's voice is heard. Um, Decision making is, is always left to the chair again uh, in this case, but that doesn't mean to see, say anyone that inputs into these things does not have a voice. Um, and again, evaluation is an ongoing thing. It's about reflection and evaluating on an ongoing basis from where we started to where we're going. So planning and responding to change. So things do change and there are two elements in this aspect that um, 
all our plans and decisions are based on a risk assessment. Nothing else. We, if it's not in that risk, if it's not identified as a risk, our plans or decision, it, it, it really shouldn't be there. The the idea is not to overstep. We the frame gives us an idea that they should be clearly documented and the rationale behind those decisions are linked directly to the risk. It, it highlights the idea that processes are dynamic and should be dynamic um, and we should be able to respond to change in risk. You know, there are always unknowns and we need to be open to that, that uncertainty. Um, we, it, it encourages, in fact, it states, frame states that, you know, we should be looking at ongoing uh, assessment and review. Uh, this is how that's done again, will be covered in the next, um, in the next presentation, but it, 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 I like the phrase dynamic link. I, it's an ever evolving process that what we're doing and what we're seeing and how we're responding is, a, is always interacting and moving forward. And again, when that change comes and we often think um, it gets worse, but it could get better. You know, it's what we decided yesterday when things get better might not be appropriate tomorrow. So if we've, if we've put lots of supervision and monitoring around that child, Suddenly, that we have to be able to, at some point to, to to potentially back away. It could, it, that could mean you know the social worker doesn't go out three times a week, might be two two weeks. So we all need to do that. But the opposite is also true. And um, any restrictions or further interventions, the opposite of what I was just saying, need to be justified and re and supported by the reassessment of risk on an ongoing um, basis. Again, to prevent overreach and you know to to not overstep our corporate parenting responsibilities so the key elements in planning and responding to change scenario planning tool for strategic decision making you know what if what then you know it's based on what we know now but that can also be informed by our own experiences you know we, we can see a child might might smash up the house tomorrow um, but the day after they might turn to hitting their parent so we need to put in tools and strategies and start to build on that to that might not go that way but it's good to think about it in those terms because it's likely that that will happen based on our own experience of working with children in similar situations perhaps um and we all need to do um an assessment on and consider what the possible impact of future risks would look like um you know we might need to start thinking about um planning you know if we if we're at the right right at the edge of of, of say accommodating a child perhaps as a, as a really kind of worst case scenario then perhaps we need to perhaps look you know if that child does escalate further you know what's the impact and is there an, a need to, to to scenario plan you know around um maybe um access or exposure to the child by other people that might trigger those things or do we look at uh, you know where would be suitable to look should that child need certain services etc and contingency planning so we're looking to scenario planning and we're looking now the actions just moving on from that we, we scenario plan now with contingency plan so i've kind of rolled those two things up but again it's about looking at what could happen the impact and then how do we plan for it and what do we need to have in place now just in case just just on the sidelines um So uh, the third element, risk management measures. Um, so anything that we do should always be based on best practice and current, the most current research available. However, um, as much as we all like to read uh, tons and tons of articles from every kind of professional magazine, actually we can never read them all. And uh, the beauty of having lots of heads around the table means that we've got lots of brains around the table and lots of potential ideas. And one of the strengths I've found is, is for, for colleagues in other agencies to point me to, you know, latest research that I might not have heard of myself or, you know, just not got to yet and things like that. So lots of head, lots of brains, lots of ideas. Um, we should look at uh, the strategies, uh, monitoring, supervision, intervention and victim safety planning. This is what Frame asks us to consider when we're doing a, a, a more formal process. Um, we always look at restrictions and interve interventions 
be constructive and individualized. They should not be preventative in nature in terms of halting development. It should not be uh, a means to hold a child from social networks, things like that. They should be constructive. So yes, we might have to take the iPad away because we know that's a trigger point because they go on Facebook or they go on um, Instagram. They you know they wind other people up and then uh, all behaviors come so that might be but we should also put in measures for instance and in how to get that back how do we build trust you know how can we move forward how can we you know give skills and encouragement and a, and a place for that trust to be used by that child and it should certainly be individualized uh, every child is unique um I, I know myself that things can become formulaic at times and uh, so we really need to challenge that idea and not take shortcuts. Measures to be proportionate to the level of risk, defensible and consistent with the remit of the responsible agencies. Again, this is just about it being, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing it the right way? And have we done it for long enough? Um, we must all, you know, I've mentioned grounding children and things, you know, uh, as a multi-agency, we don't have the legal rights effectively the legal rights at all to to restrict a child um so if if the court action is needed obviously we need to take that it's, it's obvious but it could be also more subtle than that that we're you know asking families to do something that really just kind of oversteps that corporate parenting boundary so we really need to be aware of that and if it's in the plan then we can see that and it's defensible as long as we know why we're doing it um again we're not trying to infringe on anybody's rights, but we need to be very aware of that. And Frame tells us to consider this. Um, you know, it's always about best interest and um, of the individual and around the child. Nothing is done punitively. Um, you know, and Frame just kind of makes that very distinct um, difference in its in its in the way it describes how to approach um, risk management measures. Uh, and basically, it also um, encourages us to maintain links with with any education work or placements to ensure that the child can be kept safe there in actual fact there may be very positives uh, very uh, available positives to a child um, in those environments and um, we're always trying to maintain uh, links with the adults in a child's life um, around the child that have close personal relationships um, parents you know carers teachers people who see those child for a number of hours every day or a number of hours of week that we're keeping them involved because again they can be helpful in that monitoring and supervision aspect but also in encouraging and helping to move that child field feel loved and respected so um just continuing on in this we talked about three, the key elements in each part of these five. Um, for measures and risk strategies, we look at supervision, as we've talked about before. It's, you know, to the aim being to decrease likelihood of risk taking, building on strengths. You know, work going on a couple of times a week to to empower and upskill, to take them out, to give them confidence, and it promotes engagement and aims to build trust, so that there's a key person, one key person in that person's life. You know. Uh, in the professional network that can really engage with that young child and see what's going on for them. We're looking at capacity building in it through an intervention. Um, we want to reduce vulnerabilities and increase strength. So if that means we can uh, give them better communication skills, uh, more emotional intelligence, um, and we help that child learn about themselves and learn about the world around them, and they can change their behaviors and adapt to this new way of thinking. It takes time. We look at victim safety planning. Uh, we're reducing the likelihood and impact of victims from this child's behaviours. Um, that might be a case of, you know, not encouraging a certain relationship, or keeping and monitoring our, our, this child ex experiencing these behaviours to to avoid or to deal with things in a certainly different way. Um, we want to improve their safety and maximise their resilience, um, you know, and this is all about building confidence and uh, to ensure that, you know, we're not exposing this child to situations where um, their behaviours can manifest themselves. And we we also look at incorporation of other risk management strategies. We, we're always trying to look 
at what we're doing for this victim over here is in, is incorporated now as and vice versa so, so that we're always um taking on a, an integrative approach to risk management um we look at monitoring um frame suggests that you know there needs to be a range of observational activities this really means um where they're coming from you know what we're doing uh, from different areas education health social work police home life peers you know who can be observing these the children um with these skills as they move forward as they as they build on their strengths you know we need to look at the identified risks and we need to keep close observation of that as an ongoing and from our contingencies we need to make sure that the trajectory has been halted diverted in some way so that we constantly review and monitor that so we can um to ensure that it's, it's not going that way and we need to put other things into place if they do so the fourth key consideration is partnerships in frame um it's the best approach best practice to work together in the management and assessment of risk like i say more heads more brains more ideas um and also it, it looks we have a the more people with eyes on can we can look at this child get a better world view for this child um i think within these partnerships you should always recognize conflicting emotions for child and parents um you know there can be a lot of um resistance to professionals being involved but at the same time also be lots of relief that there's somebody there to help um you know these things can come with a stigma at times so we need to recognize that and be sensitive to that and again in the calm we go through ways and means to do that we need to look that within those partnerships you know the level of participation engagement is not always consistent uh, because it doesn't need to be um you know as the risks change if they potentially change we may need more of one agency and less of another and so on and so on you know and it tells us you know that this it highlights that and that this is really a good factor in in meeting the needs of a child um we look at the child and family as as part of everything in risk management they are not separate to it they are not receivers of it they are participants of it and should be included in all decisions um as i've said before the information that comes out of this risk management meeting has to be done in appropriate manner to the and given to the child it, it encourages absolutely 100 percent face-to-face um although of course the current restrictions means that might, that might not always be possible um any decisions taken um you know is placed in the context of the child's rights and um that is also communicated and we're also trying here um through means of partnerships and communication to really have effective interagency collaboration um several risk assessment models um maintain this is absolutely key the Munro model for into, for um for instance and it talks about effective communication um so uh, communications planning how and when that's going to happen what's expected etc etc can be all laid out and, and found within either the frame process or the calm process so only one key element here it talks about information sharing sharing um it talks about relevant guidance and a recognition for the for the child's rights um if there's any legal provision needs to be uh, shared safeguarding information we need to to seek consent where sent consent is needed in all cases and we have it lays out our principles for information sharing itself so lastly the the, the final element of, of um frame is quality assurance so it gives us a nice definition as a program for the systemic systematic monitoring and evaluation of the various aspects of a project service or facility to ensure that standards of quality are being met so basically this is just saying that where there's something being provided that we revisit it that it's fit for purpose it does its job um and it kind of gives some guidance on what that what that what the requirements are so frame says you know individuals responsible will be appropriately trained i.e we're competent in what we're doing 
it's no good asking um, someone to do something if they're not trained or partially trained in it. Um, they have to be fully competent to meet a child's needs. Um, this is this is heavy stuff, and having confidence through our training and our knowledge and experience is key uh, to being open ourselves with that child and the family. Um, quality assurance is everybody's job. You know, if I'm told to do something and I don't know how to do it, I have a responsibility to tell people I can't do what you're asking me to do. At the agency and multi-agency level, it's also true. If that agency is not equipped, they have a responsibility for the quality to to obtain the training they need to do the job or, or to say they can't do it or it's not within their remit. And this goes across the multi-agency environment as well. The key players talk about social work, uh, health, education and police effectively you know but actually there's more resources that can be accessed specialist resources you know speech and language things like that so we need to really um, own what we know and what we can do and look to those that can do it better if needed um, the framework kind of talks about organizational policies and structures to ensure people are competent you know uh, this comes down to regular super individual supervision, training and development, things like that. You know, what are we seeing to meet um, the needs of children coming through? What are the trends? How do we meet those trends through training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and within the framework, it talks about agreeing specific QA requirements in the multi-agency environment. What we all need to, so we all have our own QA standards in our agency, but we need to look what this multi-agent agency environment is trying to deliver how do we monitor it are we competent to do it as an environment etc etc again so the key element in this area is um, governance and oversight so there's a risk management process again covered in the next one which uh, would be signed off by the local authority that is up for ongoing review at all times it's always done fit for purpose just because there's a process in place doesn't meet doesn't mean it will meet the constant needs it could be tweaked here and there um, with its use and then we also need to talk about serious case reviews etc if there's further incidents um, so really that's kind of the end of uh, frame um, so if you have any questions, I would like you to ask myself or Julia Mill, um, and we can do that if you want to email us. And if you want any further information, um, in time, this presentation will probably be sent out along with the notes and the framework guidance itself. Um, but please feel free to contact me uh, if you need. So thank you, and um, I look forward to hearing from you. I hope that's been helpful.